From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. It was one of the biggest stories of 2015, the Paw Sox looking to move from Pawtucket to Providence. But some state officials, including Governor Gina Raimondo, thought the pitch by the Paw Sox ownership group was a bad deal for taxpayers. Since then, it's been as quiet as McCoy in winter. Will they stay or will they go? The latest on the Paw Sox with our guest, Pawtucket Red Sox chairman, Larry Lucchino. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program, as always, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Larry Lucchino from the Pawtucket Red Sox, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Thank you for the invitation. So let's start, you know, let's get this story back into the headlines. As I said there, it's been rather quiet for a while. Um, well, so we, we're trying to turn the page from the story that was last year. <laughs> right, but, yeah. but I guess we have to go back and cover it well, a little bit. Uh, well, no, let's start now then okay. um, and get everyone up to speed as to where things stand. Is the club staying in Pawtucket or could you see moving out of Pawtucket sometime down the road? The, the short answer to that is we're not ready to answer that. This is... Um, our first full year, at least my first full year I I I at the helm of the team. And uh, what we have decided to do with the aid and uh, agreement of uh, Mayor Grebian and, P and Pawtucket and the city council there, we are focusing, we're going back to basics. We're focusing on McCoy in 2016. We'll see what the experience is like for our fans as well as for ourselves. Many of us are. Um, you know, I've, I've certainly been, been been to McCoy for games in my job as CEO of the Red Sox, but I've never spent an, an, an entire season right. here. And it seemed to us that uh, we are we were best turning the page from the political contentiousness of last year as to whether the team should uh, should stay long term in Pawtucket or whether the team should be uh, moved to a downtown location in the heart of Providence. Um, We've basically uh, made a, have an understanding with, uh, with city officials and state officials that we're going to go back to basics and try to uh, operate our team successfully and uh, see during the course of that year how what's good and bad about the uh, about McCoy. Ted and I are very interested in the politics of what happened, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But um, you said you're going to be there for 2016. I think 2017 is the 75th uh, anniversary. Yep. Oh, we're going to be there for the next few years. There's no doubt so about that. So can, can you commit to the team staying in Pawtucket through the end of the lease, which I think is the 2020 think, season? Yeah, yeah. I, certainly we're, our, our plans are honor that lease. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing that could change on that is if the state said we'd rather have you here rather than there or at this facility rather than that. But they're our, they're our landlord. There's been talk, uh, I know the lease includes actually a stipulation about uh, ordering a feasibility study on the future yeah. McCoy. I know that's that's been discussed a little more recently. Can you give us an update? Is that being done? Yeah, we've uh, reached an agreement with the mayor and we're, uh, and we're begin beginning to talk with state officials too because the l landlord technically is the state. Right. And um, uh, last year uh, our group uh, was led by Jim Skeffington and Jim was a uh, native son uh, and a very proud member of the Rhode Island and Providence community. And he saw, saw the vision of the ballpark in the heart of Providence as being an incredibly positive thing from a civic point of view as well as from a baseball point of view. Uh, and so we focused on that and, and uh, we didn't really do any study. The study had been called for a few years before that and never really got off the ground. It was just a provision in a uh, uh, in, in a whereas clause in the, in the lease and it uh, never got anywhere. Now we sat down with the mayor and we have a very healthy, con uh, constructive relationship with Mayor Grebian and, um, and we're going to uh, do what, uh, what, what I think needed to be done last year. We failed to realize it, but what needed to be done last year was to objectively analyze McCoy as it enters into its 74th year. Um, and see how uh, what's good about it, what's bad about it, and uh, what can be done about about it. And is there a, a timeline on the study when you'd like to get it done? Yeah, yeah. We we hope uh, we've got to work out the details and all of that, but we'll we'll, we'll try to get it done in in this calendar year. Jim uh, Skiffington would refer to a study that was never made public, saying that. $65 million in improvements needed to be made uh, to McCoy. So mm -hmm. w was there a study done? There was a study that was uh, undertaken uh, by us 
we, you know, we just acquired a team in February, and we uh, asked some people to do a, a to study, do a for, study investors. for for us uh, yeah, exactly. But that was not the study that was envisioned by the lease. That that was envisioned as a, a collaborative venture between the state and the team, sharing expenses and doing all sorts of things. We just did one on our own to see uh, to get to get a feel for the so, for the ballpark, and that one said. Um, to be precise, the final version of that one said uh, that it would cost fifty to sixty five million dollars to bring it uh, bring the McCoy up to um, the standards that would uh, we would apply to a state of the art kind of triple A facility. Jim, I guess being the experienced guy uh, that he was, knows that things rarely come in under budget and went to the, the high yeah, end. Not surprised Skip the budget. kept us yeah, on the yeah, high yeah, end yeah, in his yeah, public yeah, comments. Yeah. Well, no matter what the dollar amount is, and, and uh, we'll find out when the study uh, happens, but conceivably there will be a, a hefty price tag to improving it. How do you see that getting paid for? Well, you know, ag again, you're, you're uh, asking me for the conclusion to a process that has yet to begin. To begin, really, we're, we're going stepping back to take a new, fresh look at it. I think that uh, to answer your question uh, more directly, I would say we don't know the details of it all, but uh, we certainly think that there has to be a uh, public-private partnership to uh, pr most likely to make it happen. Um, have you? I guess you've kind of already said you you haven't given up necessarily on the idea of a new stadium, but the focus right now is on McCoy. What would it take to McCoy? You're not doing two tracks where you also no 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 no. We've uh, we've put all that uh, all the other work on, kind of on the back burner, and we're focusing. As I said a minute ago, this is in many ways our first full year. Uh, uh, Jim uh, was uh, was here uh, with us last year. And but many of the people that we have brought from the Red Sox are, are new to the place. This is really my full year as the chairman, uh, so this is kind of our first year, and we're going to focus on uh, on this on the experience here. And you have some experience with an old ballpark that needed work, because obviously right. you were involved when Fenway the decision yeah. was made to renovate Fenway. Knowing what you know from that, what are some of the key costs, or what are the things that, that are the biggest expenses in taking an older ballpark and bringing it up to date? Well, the first thing I would say is that every ballpark is different. Um, secondly, I would say in Fenway, uh, we took the same approach. We sort of focused on Fenway to see what we could do and to, and to get to know Fenway. It was really March of 2005, uh, really uh, into our fourth year, of ownership when we made a declaration that Fenway could indeed, in our view, be saved and we should focus on on that. So we were uh, trying to make the same kind of determination at Fenway that we are trying to make at, at McCoy and it took us uh, uh, several years. Now, additional capacity is what often costs the most. Uh, if you have to, if the building's bones are not so strong that they need uh, fundamental reinforcement, then you get the, the, those are some of the issues uh, that we had to deal with at, uh, at Fenway. But um, it proved to be the right decision there to preserve Fenway and not uh, move into a new facility, which is what uh, every other group. There are six groups trying to buy the team. Uh, we were the only one saying we would go year by year and see how Fenway uh, played out, but we had a pr uh, predilection to try to save it if possible. But uh, would the, you say, uh, all other groups. Would you say you have the same, now the same predilection I think that, with McCoy? Uh, I think it's probably close but uh, to, to that, but Fenway is a, bi a bit different because of its uh, iconic status nationally and the, uh, uh, and the solid bones that it really had in terms of its basic structure when it was built in 1912. Uh, so they're not the same kind of ballpark, but they're, we're, we're making the same kind of examination. As I foreshadowed, we do want to talk about the politics of what happened, and there was strenuous pushback from both the public and from civic leaders um, to the first pitch. Yeah, to we, heard, we, we, heard, we heard it. You did. You <laughs> got did that it. You. Did clear. that catch yeah. you off guard? It did. How come? It did a bit. Uh, in part because uh, we never in, um, envisioned that the ballpark proposal would be seen the way that it was characterized. We thought that there were uh, elements that were uh, um, not f rightly summarized in the proposal that it ended up 
being portrayed as, as a much bigger state contribution than uh, state investment that would actually be the case. But secondly, uh, uh, I've got to say that uh, uh, Jim uh, Skeffington had his finger, I, th I think, on the, uh, on the pulse of Rhode Island, was active in just everything, and I think he too was surprised at the, uh, at the kickback. Now, maybe it was because um, ballparks are different than other uh, undertakings, uh, convention center or a bridge or some well, other thing. Well, it was also thing. a different time, don't you think? And I'm wondering if there's a bit of irony here that is, does Kurt Schilling in any way play a role in what happened here in that there was well, sort of a hangover from 38 Studios? Well, those are, those are your words. Uh, uh, and I will, uh, I guess I will admit to thinking that uh, our situation was uh, certainly clouded by the hangover, as you call it, uh, from the 38 Studios. Yeah, I understand that. The and, political reality. Um, do you, were the other owners, um, it's, it's, it's awkward because of Jim's passing, of course, sure. to, to second guess uh, his decisions, but was there any frustration in the ownership group that some of those brought on board expected maybe an easy ride to build a new ballpark and instead you end up in this massive political, it consumed 2015 in a lot of ways? Um, I think uh, some of us uh, knew that it was, uh, there's always a, a, a large controversial public issue no matter what part of the country you are in. But uh, no, we didn't anticipate the kind of um, feedback, uh, if I can call it that, that, that we got uh, same, initially. Uh, the same 10 owners in place right now? Any changes? Same, no, the same ownership is in place. Jim Skeffington Sr. is, uh, uh, is his interest in the team is now held by his children and Jim Skeffington uh, Junior is, uh, is represents the family's interest there, but other than that, we have the same combination of uh, Red Sox-related uh, investors and uh, Rhode Island businessmen. Uh, we're up against a break uh, that we're going to have to go to pretty soon, but I, I have to ask you this, and this is a non-baseball yeah. question. So, Wikipedia claims that you were a classmate of Hillary Clinton at Yale Law School, yeah. and I. Ted and I like to vet things first, especially the sure. internet. Yeah. Is that accurate? It is accurate that we were at the Yale Law School at the same time. It doesn't That's sound great. like you were hanging yeah. out at the dining hall. Well, well I knew her. <laughs> where, where I really got to know her uh, uh, much better was well, our first job. We had the same kind of first job uh, coming out of law school, and that was that uh, we both worked on the impeachment of Richard Nixon. and. Uh, and that's when I got to know her uh, um, much uh, better than I knew her at, at law school. She was uh, actively involved in all manner of uh, activity at the law school, but uh, I didn't see the the work ethic, the drive, the judgment, the uh, um, the skills uh, in law school that I saw when I worked with her for a year together. Do you want to see her as president? I do. You're endorsing Hillary Clinton. Absolutely. All right. Or, all right. But I'm doing that in a personal way, not, <laughs> not in a Paw Sox way. <laughs> gotcha. If I, if no, that's I fine. That distinction. <laughs> all right. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a break. We're going to continue to talk baseball as a whole from somebody who knows a thing or two about it. Chairman of the Pawtucket Red Sox, Larry Lucchino. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is the chairman of the Pawtucket Red Sox, Larry Lucchino. Larry, I want to talk uh, broadly about baseball sure. and the long-term viability of the professional sport on a couple of fronts. The first one is the cost. And you worked at, uh, you know, you were the president and CEO of the Boston Red Sox. Fenway Park is really expensive mm -hmm. to take a family to go see a baseball game. Uh, and it's out of reach, frankly, for a lot of middle and lower class families uh, to go see a game at Fenway. Are you worried about the long-term impact that will have on the viability of the sport, the cost of seeing a, a major league I game? I think any businessman in any sport, sporting business or other business has to be worried about long-term implications, cost implications, availability uh, of tickets to a wide variety of people in the community. But those so, tickets yes, aren't going to go yeah. down. I mean, they're... Oh, no, that's, that's true. But you've got to, uh, you know, we have drawn almost three million people at the, at the Red Sox for the last several years. And, uh, uh, but as an, as an issue for all of baseball, I think it's something you have to be mindful of. You, you, otherwise, you just careen towards the $29 hot dog or something if it just you know if you're not careful and and, and managing uh, costs you want to have a stable financial uh, situation 
Pawtucket Red Sox, very different situation. It's affordable family entertainment. That's what it is. It, we have a couple of different functions. Uh, and one of them is to remain affordable and, and family oriented and, and entertainment. A lot of people go to, to Paw Sox games for the baseball, but a lot of people go for the ballpark experience. The ballpark experience is, has to be right at the top of what you're selling. And so uh, uh, we are careful to, to maintain that kind of affordability and we have a good history of that with Ben Monda. One one thing though that the big brother and little brother both share is the sport itself, um, and some people are saying that the game is just takes too long to actually mm -hmm. play. Do you support uh, speeding up the game in any way? For instance, a play co a clock for I pitchers. I do. I do actually. Yeah, and we we at the Red Sox have taken a uh, leading role in in the um, effort to. Uh, speed up the game, the pace of the game at the major league level, and the uh, and and Pawtucket as our AAA affiliate has uh, been very helpful in that regard. And the clocks that were installed at um, at AAA last year saved something like 16 or 18 minutes off the speed of the game. And now uh, we only use one of those clocks at the major league level. We didn't use the pitcher's clock. We only used the between innings clock. Mm -hmm. But uh, presumably when we use both at the major league level, it will save, uh, save uh, a roughly equivalent amount of time. And I do think that uh, that's a good thing. I think that's, uh, that's a good thing. Attention spans uh, <laughs> change. Uh, alternative forms of entertainment emerge. You've got to be constantly fine-tuning your product. And I think... Uh, Commissioner Selig and Commissioner uh, Manfred are doing an excellent job at focusing on h how to uh, uh, fine-tune the game to make it uh, uh, even more entertaining. One thing that was striking as the debate happened last term McCoy was that the attendance at McCoy had been sliding before the, the yes. fight last year. Yeah, it was sliding yeah. in the years before your group acquired it. What do you think was happening there, and do you think you can, can turn that around this mm. season? I do think we can turn it around uh, this season, but I... I, I Remember, remember uh, Pawtucket was right at the top of the uh, of the list of Triple A teams, minor league teams. There are 160 minor league teams. There are 30 Triple A teams. Pawtucket was always mentioned among uh, as being among the jewels of those uh, franchises, uh, and so we really had only uh, one way to go. And it's uh, it's now in the middle of the pack, really, in in uh, in baseball. That's not. That's the reality. It's not necessarily the way people see it, and we've got to be mindful of the fact that we have uh, shifted status a bit from the top of the pack to the middle of the pack, and we, we've got to reverse that and reignite the fan base and reignite the business community here to get to get the Paw Sox back where they belong, which is right at the top. How of do you see doing that? Way. Well, it's a lot of ways. One is uh, community outreach, and we uh, one of the obligations. I, I frequently talk about the. Uh, three or four obligations of ownership, and one of them is to uh, is to create the right kind of ballpark experience and environment um, that uh, attracts people. Uh, another one of them is to, is to uh, uh, aggressively participate in the community, uh, in the charitable and civic life of the communities that, that uh, are our uh, our marketplace. And I think we can do that. We have begun doing that. Uh, so, and I think that uh, it's tied very much to the future's uh, success of the big team too right. as the Red Sox get better and they are getting are better. Are they going well, to? They, there's yeah. only one way for them yeah. to go. I yeah, mean. they are. Yeah, that's true. But, but if you look objectively at the, at the core of veteran talent and the core of young talent and the pitching improvements, uh, I think the next great Red Sox team is uh, not too far down the road. And with that will come a, uh, an increased interest in baseball and the Red Sox because people want to see the rising stars of the future and they will see them up close and personal at, uh, at uh, Pawtucket. And out of everything you said in the show, that's the soundbite you'll be grilled on now for the future <laughs> oh, years really? to see if it comes <laughs> true. Yeah. Um, uh, there was a really interesting series uh, our, a contributor to our station, Brian McPherson, who works for the Providence mm -hmm. Journal, did on the low pay of minor league players. So yeah. We think of athletes getting huge paychecks. Minor league, very different. Uh, granted, the revenue is different, too. But yeah. is that something you think your fellow owners need to look at in the minor leagues at all? Do you think the players well, there, are being treated there right? There is a plan to look at it again. The current agreement between the major leagues and the minor leagues leagues ends in 2020 and when that uh, right before that uh, the end of that there will be a uh, 
a negotiating committee formed to uh, talk about things like player salaries and working conditions and and all of that. So uh, there is a plan to to look at it. Um, I just start from the premise that. Uh, Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball are very different products. And if you try to uh, take everything from one and, and uh, just uh, slavishly apply it to the other, you're going to make a mistake. But you can take some things from one and uh, more cleverly apply it to the other. But they are two different uh, businesses and the, certainly the minor league players who make it certainly make up Oh, in time for the uh, uh, lesser salaries that they endure when they're in the minor leagues and the opportunities for gigantic salaries are, are prevalent in Major League Baseball. Speaking of gigantic salaries, I want to ask you about David Ortiz. Um, he uh, says this is his last year uh, and his agent said a call from Pedro Martinez to you was a big reason Ortiz came to Boston. Does he have that right? He does. He does indeed. We were uh, it was at the end of the 2002 season, right around Christmas time, and uh, it's rare that I get a call from one player talking about another Is player. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you think they would be talking about themselves in their contract uh, situation. <laughs> but Pedro said, it's not about me, because we were in the middle of negotiating an extension for Pedro. This is not about me. This is about uh, David Ortiz. He's a wonderful guy. He's a terrific hitter, and this team would be better with uh, with uh, David Ortiz. And uh, so we talked about it a bit internally, and uh, there was some concern about whether we had too many candidates for the position of DH. DH yeah. um, but uh, my view was that uh, Pedro was endorsing him. First of all, that's a big deal. And secondly, we were negotiating with Pedro, and uh, we could do, uh, all he was asking for was a small favor, give a spring training introduction, uh, yeah. uh, invitation to David Ortiz. So to me, it was a, a no-brainer. We invited him, and- uh, That worked it, out. It worked out, <laughs> uh, shall we say, it worked out awfully well over time, yeah. I'm sure it did. I wanna turn uh, back to McCoy and, and your yeah. role as chairman. Um, if, I know it's an if, it's, you've made that sure. clear, but if you were to stay at McCoy, one thing that was discussed uh, last year a bit is that the neighborhood around McCoy has actually never seen much development, even though it's got this uh, stadium, this big attraction in the middle there. Do you, do you see any or the other, uh, your fellow owners, see any room for opportunity beyond the, the gates of the stadium? Well, certainly the, uh, the mayor uh, of Pawtucket uh, does. He uh, urges us to take an expansive look, at not, not just at the... Uh, bones and characteristics of McCoy, but also uh, what's around there and how it can be made uh, bigger and better and, uh, and uh, more uh, interesting and convenient for our fans. So I think that will be a part of the McCoy study when we, when we get, get around to doing it. Is there a minor league, uh, another minor league team that you want to emulate that you think is just knocking it out of the park? Well, there are, there are se several teams uh, who have um, risen to the top where the Pawsox used to be. Uh, the team in Charlotte is, uh, is done exceedingly well. The team in Lehigh Valley has done exceedingly well. Do they uh, both, do they have new stadiums? They both do have new facilities and that's, uh, but that's not the only characteristic that they share, but that's certainly uh, a major one uh, to be sure. So, um, uh, but for us, it's uh, engaging with our fan base and creating the right kind of ballpark experience at McCoy and making and finding out if we can uh, do it as well as we feel it needs to be done uh, at McCoy. When you look at the future of baseball, not just at McCoy, across yeah, professional sure. baseball, you've spent your career uh, yeah. working with these teams. What's your biggest worry as you look out at the future of baseball? Well, well, I, I suppose the uh, the issue of the uh, aging and graying of the baseball fan has got to be. Uh, uh, near the top of that list, and that's why we make a concerted effort both uh, at the Red Sox in previous years, and we will here in P uh, Pawtucket as well, to reach out to uh, to children, to young uh, young people, and uh, make sure that they see some of the great uh, charms and attractions of baseball as we did when, when we were growing up. So that's certainly uh, one of the issues that I think has to animate anybody who's in the in the baseball business. In fact, yesterday, one of the day, this past week, we announced a uh, a new program, a, a lunchbox program, where uh, kids come to the ballpark at noon. They have a lunch in the uh, owner's box, and they get to meet one of the players who sits around and talks with them for ten or fifteen minutes about. Uh, 
issues that are pertinent to a uh, to a young student and that's a uh, you know I know it's a it seems like a drop in the bucket but making that kind of connection from player to young person is uh, one way to uh, accelerate two, the process. Here's two cents from a father of two. Uh -huh. Those postseason games, and I have 30 seconds left. Tell here. me, I agree with you. They're on way they too start late. Way too late. Way too late. I, I agree I'm just with not you. Not letting them I, stay up. I, I, I agree with you. And uh, they, they you know, watch I, Patriots I, games I at one. Fight. I, I have fought this fight uh, <laughs> with with uh, uh, baseball before, and they say the networks are eager to get as many eyeballs as yeah. possible. And uh, we, we we start from an East Coast perspective, and they urge us just to recognize. <sighs> There are nine and ten year olds. So he's going to move to California. Coast, okay, then I'll just move. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Larry Lucchino, chairman of the Pawtucket Red Sox. Great conversation. Thank Thanks you. for uh, Thanks joining guys us on the, the program. Invitation. If you missed it, it's online, WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We will see you next week right here on Newsmakers.